Something's wrong. I don't even know what to tell you it is. You make it a little fixed corner. You think we can get through silt beds and the steps with that? Um. And we are back here, day two of Tech Agency in Ensenada. And I'm here on the stage with 585, Matt Barnes, Base Camp Off-Road. How's it going, brother? Not bad. How are you guys? I'm doing very well. You guys Good. are a long way from home. You told me a little bit ago you're from New York. You guys are four days out here. Good. Have you guys done this race before? We have. This is uh, our fourth time to Baja, third time racing the 1000. Now we come from Rochester, New York. In the Finger Lakes, New York, we've got two members uh, out of state, one from Louisiana, uh, Monroe, Louisiana, West Monroe and one uh, from San Diego, just north of us here. So uh, our team is around here. Got a bunch of guys put a bunch of time into this, a bunch of sponsors that really, really came forward for us. Hard to sell Baja in upstate New York. You guys are getting ready to do 1,226 miles. Give me a little bit of insight into your strategy going into this race with this five car. It looks like it's done up well next year. It is. Uh, we did a little bit of pre-running. Obviously, this is our third time. We've, we've uh, definitely learned from our failures, right? Some successes, but some failures also. So. Uh, we're gonna try our best. We have the right chase uh, pol or chase strategy and obviously race strategy. We just have to go out and implement that. So a lot harder said than done, as you guys know, here in the Baja Peninsula. excitement and enthusiasm for this unique race. Truly, the stories are unique for nowhere else in the world of motorsport. Is there another event quite like Baja Beef? See the toughest, most demanding on a driver and team of any event in North America. Peninsula. Ensenada is up here and La Paz is down here. In the early years of the Baja 1000, this is about the only course map the racers had. Organizers said, hey, the race starts here. We'll see you down here in a couple of days and you figure out how to get here. Over the years, the map, though, has become a lot more detailed. Checkpoints and pit stops have sprung up all along the way. You know, the Baja 1000. Watched it on the ABC's Wide World of Sports, if you remember that as a kid. So I always wanted to do it. Uh, came down as obviously an adult, had a little bit of opportunity to maybe buy a car and start building a car for Baja. So what car do you choose, right? Again, I reached out to a team in California called Gonzo Racing. They've become very dear friends with us. Mark and Trevor Anderson, they raced a bug. It's my first car, was a Volkswagen bug, but it's also the first car that won Baja. You know, a Volkswagen engine, um, doom buggy won the Baja 1000 in 1967. So I thought it'd be kind of cool to honor the roots of the Baja 1000. And honestly, it's probably the hardest class to try to finish the Baja 1000 is. So that challenge is there too, right? We call ourselves adventurers and we look for adventures as we get older and the challenge is there. Well, the challenge is no greater than the one sitting behind me. You know, at my age, you, you kind of need something to look forward to more than just like a trip to Florida or, a, you know, uh, something small. Uh, competing in the Baja to me is a, it's a huge ordeal. I've really, you know, I've, I've loved doing it and uh, it gives me something to look forward to. Well, it gives you a drive that most, most of us have, especially folks from law enforcement or other types of jobs like that. You're always looking for that next adventure. Uh, Baja brings it out and it's, it's, it's the world, like I said, unknown, uh, but it's the world's most challenging off-road race. Uh, you know, so if you're gonna be challenged, you might as well be challenged by the world's most, whatever that is. It was a very serious, intense track. It took a lot out of the drivers and the uh, navigators and I was, I was like, I was super impressed. And this, you know, feeds, you know, something in my being that thirsts for adventure. It's 
a big unknown and a, a big challenge. And it was something I, I've always wanted to do after hearing my dad and Matt talk about it for, for so many years. And it was the perfect time to, to join the team and go. Never know what adventures are out there unless you say yes to even starting them. So I, I probably would not have gone on this trip earlier in my life because I would have been worried about the money, the time off, the, the risk for physical injury, the risk of security in, in that environment. At this point in my life, I'm like, let's do it, whatever. If we can make it happen, make it happen. What does it mean to me? I'm not about the glory of it, I'm really not. Um, and honestly, for us, we're such a small team, there's no glory for us, right? It's the fact that you can set a goal, form a team, get people to buy into your idea, right? And try to overcome or I guess rise to that challenge is awesome. That's what it's, it's for me. And I guess as you get older, as a kid, you look forward to birthdays, right? Maybe get a new BMX bike or summer vacations, right? Going swimming at the lake, whatever it is. And as you get older, you know, graduating high school is a big deal. You get to go to college. You know, you get your first real true girlfriend, right? You fall in love. Um, you have kids, whatever course, you, you know, you take in life or whatever direction you go, you get your first job, right? You buy your first house. All those things are exciting, those incremental um, challenges in life. As you get older, you know, your kids are grown. You've bought your first house. You've graduated from college. What is there? Right? Did the challenges stop? I don't know. Maybe for some people. You know, for me, I'm, I'm a 49-year-old man now. And um, when this started, you know, started, I guess, this is coming up on our 10th year. It's, it's humbling. And um, I take an immense amount of pride in it. I, I'll say it. I think I've said it 100 times. Our team this year was awesome. It truly was. And to be part of it with other people and to see people get excited, you know, about what you're doing and now what they're doing as part of a team, a collective unit, right? In the military, they call it esprit de corps. It's basically setting the goal, getting the unit to buy into that goal and overcoming that objective. And that's just what this is. The bug itself, 1974 Volkswagen Beetle. Um, the only thing really is original to the car is the body and doors. Everything else has um, been built a uh, one-off race from the suspension in the front, suspension in the rear, uh, to the trailing arms, to the motor, to the transmission, to the seats, switches, gauges, everything. Um, again, like I said, Gonzo Racing out in Southern California helped me in the beginning. They basically told me you know, what the, the products were to buy, what held up and what didn't. I kind of copied them. so. Can't take a lot of credit for it. I didn't build the car, I was more the labor. But uh, just some, some things to uh, point out. You can see the King uh, bypass, which are three different bypass uh, uh, with the reservoir shocks. Uh, we have dual rack and pinion with a electronic um, power steering. Therefore, if the electronic power steering craps the bed, they do. we still have manual. If you run a hydraulic system, it's a lot more difficult to run the manual. We'll just walk it around real quick. Um, inside we obviously have, obviously have light bars. You'll see obviously, uh, just like any car, steering wheel and seats. Uh, the seats are suspension seats. Uh, we have fresh air here and we have comms cable here so we can talk over the engine noise and the bumping and uh, rolling of the Baja 1000. Um, obviously fire extinguisher, we have a fuel cell. Uh, we got the things I'm leaning on are traction boards. They come off, stick them under the tire to try to get out of the silt. Uh, silt's like a fine talcum powder. Uh, that's created by the pre-running of all the vehicles down here through Baja. So try to build as many dual systems as we can into the car in case one fails, but a uh, car this size is only so much we really can do. Talk to me a little bit about what pre-running does and how it helps get you in that new zone for, for the race in the coming days. Well, pre-run is essential. I mean, you got to get out there and get warmed up. It's a chance to get on the course. It's a chance maybe to look at some of the very difficult parts you might see at nighttime or other times. Uh, and pre-run was actually, you know, practice on those. Pre-run is so important. The first year we went down there at the start line, the uh, commentator asked us, you know, have you ever pre-run this course? I've been doing a little pre-running. We did a little pre-running over to San Felipe uh, this summer, back in June, and uh, that's about it. Ooh. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> uh, and that was a that was a telling sign right there that, uh, you know, you're going to go out here without pre-running this thing. It's it's pretty dangerous and it's uh, it's so it's so important. We're in Ojos Negros. 
We're going to pre-run out to uh, Valley Trinidad, Valley T they call it, and then hit the crossover road. And uh, just try to get a handle on our section. Baxter and I ran a little bit of this section back in 2018. So um, semi-familiar, but we still have a lot, a lot to learn. Try to make some notes on the GPS also. So that's the goal for today, is to get a few miles underneath our belt and free run. Was it rough? Oh. So uh, we have a little downtime. We had the car uh, tech this morning. So versus go back and eat tacos and sit at the hotel, come down here and just train, just run repetitions. Because when uh, people get sleep provide and obviously hunger sets in fatigue sets in over the length of this race at 50 hours everyone's going to be running either driving navigating or, or, um, or chasing uh, you know people tend to make small minute mental mistakes mental mistakes and kill somebody uh, it may sound simple we've all changed tires all jacked up a car you just run over more repetition repetition builds memory so that's what we try to do today As you can see we got the jack out there's specific uh, ways you put a jack in at least for this car they're pinned you don't pin them from bottom up because gravity is your friend. Pin them from top bottom. Uh, all that little mental preparation. So versus sit there and do nothing today, we're just running repetition or repetitions, so um, so people can ingrain it in their brain. Not only that, it takes away uh, the nervousness of the race tomorrow too. So there's a mental aspect of this also. But uh, that's all we're doing. Just running repetitions. It may soon seem absolutely uh, unnecessary, but it's very necessary. You'll see it in a couple hours uh, when you get in a chase truck and do your uh, part of this cog in the wheel. Um, just absolutely draining. There's a fatigue that's going to set in you can't explain. But uh, hopefully the preparation and this training uh, can ease that a little bit or help the final goal and that's to get to La Paz. Make sure you work over these boards in the desert. So if you drop it, where's the drop? On your boards, not the desert. Jeff and Chase One will stop. So I would get on the sat phone at that time, contact Jeff, Chase One, see if he's tracking, and if he can get an update of their mileage. If you use your fingers to zoom in and out, it's going to take a fall. Wow, let's go to the side. Slow. Yep. Then that's going to start fighting here. Good morning. It is race day. Um, the team is going to be leaving the hotel here in about 15, 20 minutes, heading down to get lined up. We're going to head out about 10 to 15 minutes after uh, the race car and get set up at the first pit. Leaving the hotel parking lot on day one, you know, I really felt the sense that we, we, we could do this one. This would be longer than the other ones. The other, ones, the other two races, 800 miles, this is 1,200 miles. Uh, I felt pretty confident. Um, I think we had prepared a ton and it was time to put that preparation to work. The expectations is the start, start strong. First 100 miles are slow, methodical, very technical. We've got to take our time. After that, we're going to see you in La Paz. High, high, expe high expectations. I think yes, that's very high. Third time's a charm. I honestly, I felt confident. I really did. We had a good game plan, had a great team, um, had a great crew, had three different chase trucks. All right, live from Chase 3, 
We just left the hotel, Ryan and Ryle. We are gonna be the first chase truck to meet up with the race car. And right now we are just heading out of town. We're gonna traffic. We had, we had practiced, we had rehearsed, we'd gone over everything uh, that we possibly could. You know, we'd worked very, very hard for that year leading up to this. So I, I did feel confident, but I also knew the monster that awaited us. You know, we're not ignorant to that fact. We've been there. Um, we know what it does, you know, it kicks you in the teeth. The Bax and I started off the first uh, 270 or so miles. We had pre-run that section. We knew it was one of the rougher sections for this year's race, and it was gonna be a slower section. You know, we didn't have a chance to open it up or make up any time. You know, the follow-on drivers and co-driving teams had to make up time for us, and we knew that. You know, Travis, me, and, and Todd uh, pre-ran our section. We knew it was gonna be a slow section, a lot of hills, a lot of silt, a lot of rocks. You know, and so we knew we had to push through. great time. You know, we made fantastic time. We made some hill climbs. If we tried to do 20 times, we could probably only finish it once, and we happened to be fortunate enough to make it up during that one time. Uh, there was one particular hill we were very, very excited to get up, um, you know, on the side of a mountain. Date about uh, 45 minutes ago, half an hour ago, that the Can Am was en route to work on recovering the race car. Um, I guess it got stuck in some silt. Came down to about 20, 20 or so miles, 10 to 20 miles outside of our first uh, driver change, scheduled driver change, at about 270, I think it was, something like that mile marker, or race mile 270. We got stuck in silt, came around a left hand turn. It was like a parking lot of cars, and we just buried it. Good timing on a very slow section, right? A lot of silt, a lot of silt. How would you describe silt? It's, it's a unique substance that I never saw before anywhere in my life. When you hit it, um, if you do not have your shield pulled down on your helmet, it will get into every orifice of your body. Almost like a fifth physical state. You've got you know, solid liquid gas, plasma, and silt. It flows like water, you know, it'll come over, you know, the front end of the vehicle when you plow into it, it'll move like water. It's literally feet deep and uh, you, you come do? upon it sometimes out of nowhere and you just sink in the stuff or it flies in your face and, and uh, it's, it's, of all the things in Baja, it's, it's the one thing that I hate. We came around a the corner, there was a couple of cars stopped, done. Dug out from there, we got stuck probably five or six different times in silt kept digging out we'd go 10 feet get stuck again and just set us back two and a half to three hours well it's important to put things in perspective like you said because yeah. the reality is and i know it's a 
you know, we've got a uh, finite amount of time to get there, but we're three hours behind. We're not yep. three days behind. No, you're right. We're three hours exactly behind. Exactly right. So we continue on. If you buy 45, you get a Baja Pits. Call us. Okay. Take a minute while they're filling up. Get out. Call us. And go. Hey, I have fuel. Because then you can make it too. Then we're back on schedule to 6:34, and we don't need to go into El Arco. So how are we getting in El Arco? We got to go through there anyways. You going through in there anyways? We're taking an access road. So we're we're gonna meet you at El Arco? Yeah. Okay. Unless I hear different. Okay. Okay. So that's what we've been doing, and it's been a perfect just calling out there. Only when we're hauling ass, so like 50 is it a yeah. little close? Yeah. But. Six eighty after eleven miles of silt. Can't describe it anymore. Anybody Can't cares? I got blisters on both feet, size of ping pong balls. I, uh, I'll let you pop them later on if you want. Marathon or Baja One Thousand murder? Mar uh, Baja One Thousand. <laughs> How many marathons have you done? Ten. <laughs> Seven oh six point five. Champion Hill. We already stopped there today. Fucking Rubeau. What a bunch of bullshit that was. <laughs> I don't even know how to describe what the hell just happened. Baxter, did you get any sleep from last night? No. I know. That's yeah. the problem. Like well, no problem. It's not the problem. Hey Matt. Yes. We put Chase Team three down for Chase of the Year. Yeah, we are. We already have. We submitted it. The committee's. Uh, Reviewing the paperwork now. I put a gold star next to your name on the. Good? Oh. Door shutting. 706. 
5.5. Almost there, boys. Yep. two or three o'clock in the morning. Um, we rolled out, it was uh, a pretty dense fog, so we were kind of just driving through the fog into, into nothing um, for hours on end. The, the big challenge there um, was we had no way to get gas from our chase crew to the, the section of the course we were going. Um, so we had to rely on Baja pits. They had promised us that's the one pit they would leave open was the, the pit we needed for gas, but sure enough, we rolled into town and they were not there. Um, so Travis, in his knowledge of Baja, was able to find the, the one gentleman selling gas out of a shed on the side of his house. Um, and we were able to actually buy gas from him and fill up and, and get to the next point we needed to to meet up with the chase crew. Outside race mile 933, uh, waiting for the race car to do our second to last driver change, believe that or not. Um, outside of a town called uh, Loretto. What day, what day is it? So, I don't know what day is it. It's, um, I'm not being funny. Saturday, Saturday, right? You're laughing. No, Sa I, Saturday, I don't know. I don't Saturday, know uh, yeah, it was Saturday. Whole team's been up, uh, I think, 5 a.m. on, and, uh, I can't think. On Thursday morning, we got up uh, to pack up the race car and go down to the start line. So, so from 5 a.m. on Thursday morning, so 24 hours would be Friday morning, 48 hours would be Saturday morning. I don't know what time it is now. Um, you know, 12 to noon or so. So we got uh, that's what we got 30 hours, 48. So we got how's my math? 54 hours. Can't even think. So 54 hours we've been up. Uh, I might have grabbed a couple hours. Uh, if you want to call it sleep in the chase truck uh, while monitoring the radio and stuff like that, but everyone's in the same boat, not just me. Uh, everyone's been up for that long. I have you now. I do cap you, go ahead. We're at the location, we're at the, the meeting point, we're at the rendezvous. We will be there in five minutes, five mics out.
pavement. As soon as you come to the crest of the hill, we're on your right hand side. Watch where I have you pull over. I got a green Watch chem light. Watch, Watch the fuel line up. Pull me in front of the truck. He got out of the car and took his helmet off. And Ryan and I were sitting there and the car looked weird. You know, the car just kind of looked like it sat like off camber for whatever reason. Got a flashlight? The shock bolt's good. Yep. I literally pulled Ryle about a mile before. I'm like, man, we're really bottoming out. Something's wrong. I don't even know what to tell you it is. Torsion bar. Torsion bar is broken. Let me see the light, Matt. Yep. Here. Torsion bar. Your, your call. Duster's still in. Did you have that supporting tube? Duster's still there. It's torsion bar. It's gotta be. Fuck. Damn. So fucking close. The whoops? It's been whoops for 20 miles, but we haven't been jumping them. It's Spliced just been the tire too, bro. I can't believe you have air in the tire. That's easy. Good call, Travis. It's a hard call. It's a hard call. Like, if it's just the roads, no big deal. But like that south, that silt road, we would have been fine, but this, it bottomed out and got us kind of stuck right there. I like I said, I literally told Ryle, I can't, we keep bottoming out on stuff, like it's weird. Because it's been whoops, we've just been ah, ah, ah. What do you got, 100 miles to go? This is 110? Yeah, 100, 100 miles. And the steps. Yeah. Spring plug? Torsion bar. bar. It's a 300 millimeter torsion bar, you know what? Extreme pressure. Takes a snap of Let me pass it by the team. See what they want to do. Chase three to uh, chase one and two. What do you do at this point, right? We're thinking we're done. Uh, we're up on top of the mountain. Communication is very limited in Baja. And I just happened to look at my cell phone and I had like two bars, I think it was. So we called, I called uh, Mark Anderson in San Diego. He answered the phone. And usually you don't have cell service in, in Baja. You know, we rent satellite phones to communicate. We have CB radios and cell phones. We have three forms of communication, but uh, we were very, very fortunate for whatever reason divine intervention, whatever you want to call it, uh, to have cell phone service. And I said, Mark, I think we snapped the torsion bar. Yeah, so you think you snapped the torsion bar, and do you guys have a spare by chance? We don't have a spare, spare torsion bar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the only thing that I could suggest is that you could uh, go without no suspension by strapping something to your shock. You use your shock to hold that, that corner up, uh, you know, Make it a rigid rear end. You know, like a two by four. That's all you could do. You can kind of jam something in between the so spring plate and the casting of the torsion housing to make it a fixed corner. You think we can get through silt beds and the steps with that? Um, I think so. Yeah. I, so, I, I, you're so close, I would. I would try. So you're saying jack up the rear end, guys, and put a two by four or something. You, you know what they're saying, right, yes. Travis? Yeah. Travis here. Travis is driving, um, so he knows him and I are here. So he knows who you're talking about. I think I do. So I guess that's what we'll do. Um, we'll get a, a strap and we'll strap something in there. Are you guys, yeah? Yeah, I think that's your only option at this point. And, and then you're going to have to go slow, you know, over rough stuff. But I think you'd be able to get over the steps as long as you've got you know, your hand clearance. Just take it slow. Okay, I think we might try that. All right, guys. Yeah. Okay, thanks for yeah, answering. I don't, I don't I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Okay, okay. Bye, bye bye. We gotta find a two by four. So I'm going through the chase box and before we left Rochester, upstairs of the barn, I had a spare piece of, um, of steering arm and it was a piece of metal. And for whatever reason, I stepped over it, you know, when we were packing for Baja 
must have stepped over that thing 15, 20 times. And I remember grabbing it, and I threw it in one of the chase boxes, thinking, God, that'd be an easy piece of metal that we could weld to something, right? To fix, right? To do a remote fix. I'm thinking weld. And in that chase box, in the back of that tundra, at that particular night on top of a mountain in Baja, I looked at that steering arm, and I'm like, oh, dear gosh. And I think Ryan has video of us. Um, you know, we all kind of pooled our resources or our talent, if you will. And we cut it with a hacksaw um, that Travis happened to have in the back of the truck. And we wedged it in that shot. They're right here. These are nice to be fine. I don't know, man. I'm I don't know. Do you want to cut that off? I do. I just want to make sure. I think we have enough room with it on. Yeah. We're at Alpha Boss. I'm down in there. Okay, good. Just fix it. I touch my fingers. Okay, good. Okay. Keep this up. Good. Keep that up. That just gives us highway miles here. I, I get it. I understand what you're doing. Anybody? David? Jeffrey? Jeff? No, I'm not. Unfucking believable. Fixing and fixing and getting the gas and our gas, uh, our gas supplier, our pit crew, Baja Pits, didn't come through for us. They closed all the pits early, so we had to pit ourselves. Travis's knowledge of Baja obviously got us through that. The rest of the team picked up the slack on every single night with the plans. We knew the plans were going to change. We had a good plan down before we came, but like every good plan laid down, it changes when the race starts and the world starts. So just an uh, unbelievable job by everybody. Feels so good. Ten years of building the car. Three years of racing. For ten years to right here. We got to find someone to get a picture of us. <laughs> 